he gave you a feeling of weight. He was there, and you had to notice him. I think that's、uh, what I what I remember him by. And I think something else that I don't know if other people notice: his head was somewhat bigger than normal. I think a guy who's pretty tall for a Chinese with a big head. Reasonably tall, but、um, large head. <laughs> I think he was just a very normal person with a gift. He exuded a strange kind of. Majesty of some sort of—you knew you were in the scent of things when you, if you knew him. I think he was a very happy man. He said he was a Mandarin, so he wasn't trained to do anything. He said it was really a good thing that, that he found mathematics. Otherwise, he he doesn't know what he would have done. I went to mathematics、uh, gradually and automatically, no decision. Professor Chen was different of geometry. He brought up the whole field for about twenty, thirty years. He'd studied with Elie Cartan, who was arguably the leading geometer of certainly the first half of the twentieth century. Chern was the translator for many of us to this obscure way of of Elie Cartan of doing things. Chern was one of those people who really did see down to the foundations and really understood what was important. I was born in a small town, and there was uncertainty about the situation, so I left as as a small baby to the countryside. Professor Chern was born in 1911. That was the year that modern China was born. We overthrew the Manchu Dynasty in 1911. His family then moved to Tianjin to this city, and when he was quite young, and then he joined the Fulun Middle School. After he finished the middle school, he got into the Nankai University, and got his the bachelor degree here. And then he went to graduate school at Tsinghua, and then Blaschka came to Tsinghua to give a talk. Then he recognized that there was all of this world of mathematics outside of China, which he wanted to explore. When he got a fellowship to study outside of China in 1934, he went to Hamburg, where Blaschka was, and studied web geometry and integral geometry. My relation with Blaschka was very close.、Uh, incidentally, you see, when I first saw him. He started by giving me a bunch of his、uh, latest reprints, mostly on、um, web geometry. I studied them. I discovered a gap in one of his proofs, so he was very glad. A new student from China was able to detect something essential. And Blaschka says, "Oh, well, that's very interesting. Well, if you can correct that mistake, then that's your thesis." And he wrote a beautiful dissertation. It has these amazing diagrams. They're very geometric, and they show this wonderful early insight that Chern had that married this ability to do very complicated calculations with just being able to see what was true. After Blaschke, then he went several months to Bali to Eli Carton. Chern guided me into reading papers that Carton had written. Uh, they were very difficult to understand, and Chern explained it in very simple terms. It was very elegant. Notation can play a very important role, and in differential geometry, there were notation wars for many years. And then in the 1920s, Carton invented a new notation called moving frames. And when Chern studied with Carton, he became an expert. Then in 1937, he was ready to come back to China. That was the first year of the Sino-Japanese War. For safety, they had moved the Beijing University to Kunming in southwest China. So Chern went to Kunming to help get the university going. It was there that he met Xinning and married her. 
my mother became pregnant, so she went back to Shanghai and had my brother in Shanghai in 1940. And then uh, Kunming was in danger. So the American army got him out over the Burma Road and he made his way to the United States, here to the Institute. The main person of contact at the Institute at that time was Herman Vau. Herman Vau had tried to understand Kartan at one point and he gave up, but Chern could explain it. Chern did two very important pieces of work during his period at the Institute for Advanced Study. The first one was his proof of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, which relates the bending or curvature of a surface to its global topological properties, how many holes it has in it, if you think of a surface as being like a donut with many holes. That led to Chern classes, the fundamental characteristic classes in geometry, in topology, in algebraic geometry, it's impossible to conceive of differential geometry without, without churn classes, so I would think that that would be regarded as his most important contribution. It was such an important idea. It was so original and, and foundational that people studied it so much that it became part of the way we think. From Princeton, I went back in 1946, and that was immediately after the end of the of the war. He was entrusted with the creation of the Mathematics Institute in Academia Sinica. China at that point did not have enough good mathematicians. He was the institute founder and director. He was its only professor and he taught them topology from morning till dusk. But then the communist revolution took over and, uh, and he left the country. Chern came to the United States, first to the Institute for Advanced Study, where he had been uh, during the war. In 1949, he began teaching in University of Chicago. Chicago was very intense. Chicago was the center of science in the world when he was there. His notes from that course became the basis of present-day differential geometry throughout the world. I mean, life was, life was good. But Chicago was very cold and very windy in the winter. We came to California, I guess, in March of 59. He came to Berkeley as a new star. In a very short period of time, he had a great department in differential geometry. He was a teacher. He didn't try to explain everything so that there was nothing for you to do, but he taught you to see the importance and beauty of things. He always seemed to have infinite patience, and he always seemed to have infinite time for me. He listened very well. He made few guiding remarks and lots of encouragement. Not many women in mathematics. So I, when I first met him, I feel very comfortable. He didn't make me, he didn't treat me differently as if I'm a woman. He sort of tried to give me confidence, say it's okay, just work. Jern was in a sense, Berkeley's most distinguished professor. Whenever we had to go to the chancellor to make some special request, we always took Chern along, and it always worked. Somehow, he had a presence, a gravitas. He, there was something about him that people just listened to him and uh, usually did things his way. We had put in for a new math institute out there, and Cal and I convinced Chern that he should be the director. I told Chern that he didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was be there. I think it's all indirect somehow. See, I, uh, I never want to do anything. Yeah. His persona, the way he looked at things, the way he uh, dealt with the world was very much tied uh, to his basic Chinese culture. Andre Wei, whose collaboration with Chern had gone way back, decided to use this Tang Dynasty sculpture of a horse as the frontispiece for his book. Chern did a calligraphy to accompany it. This says, the old horse knows the way.
His interaction with China resumed after the Cultural Revolution was over. Chern went to China, talked to people there, and also convinced the Chinese government that it was in their interest to finance the studies of Chinese mathematicians abroad. At that time, we didn't have many established mathematicians to come to give lectures. So if there was a lecture by famous mathematician, of course we all went there, even though we didn't understand what he was talking about. Professor Chen set up a bridge between mathematicians of China and America and Europe. Professor Chen has the vision to really set up an institute inside the mainland of China so that more young people can get educated. In Berkeley to in the process of establishment of the Nankai Institute of Mathematics, now it's called the Chen Institute of Mathematics, Professor Chen and Professor Hu get much help from the high ranked officers in Chinese government, including Mr. Deng, Mr. Jiang, and also some other ministers. After his retirement, he was settling between China and Berkeley for about 20 years. And then in 1999, he decided to move back to China permanently. He was the one that had the idea of having the International Congress in Beijing in 2002. Jiang Zemin committed to having the uh, opening ceremony in the Great Hall of the People. Chern had the stature to mobilize the Chinese government to do this. Chern was certainly well recognized in his career. He was a member of the National Academy. He got the National Medal of Science here obviously a member of the Chinese National Academy, a member of several foreign academies around the world. And my father received the Shaw Prize in September of 2004, and it was the first time that the Shaw Prizes were awarded. The Shaw Prize is a million dollars, US. Of that million, it was all, it was all donated. Chern said to me once, if you do one thing that's really good, that's all you can really expect in a lifetime. We marveled at Chern's ability to continue to produce interesting and deep mathematics throughout his career. And when I asked him about this, he replied that the trick is to have enough good ideas when you're young to last a lifetime. A few days before his death, Chen speaks about proving some important conjecture more than 50 years old. We hear him discuss some idea of proving this theory. I should work up to my days, according to Chen's advice. <laughs> I usually call him an you know, ordinary great man because usually people like to say that extraordinary people, unusual people. I consider him as a very usual person, but great. He encouraged you to do things which may not be the norm, but he was looking out into the distant future. His sight was further than most other people. There's a quotation from Lao Tzu, uh, an ancient Chinese philosopher that could have been written about Chern. The master does his job and then stops. He understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. 
Because he believes in himself, he doesn't try to convince others. Because he is content with himself, he doesn't need others' approval. Because he accepts himself, the whole world accepts him.